First, it's uh, it's yeah, it's Strom like long O. Go home, Mr. Strom, Yale Strom. Um, so let's see. Well, uh, a little bit by myself, just real quick. So those who don't know who I am, um, I come from the. I, I've lived by the three great bodies of water: the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Great Lakes. I'm originally from Detroit, a proud Detroiter, and lived in New York City for many years, uh, particularly Astoria, Queens, of those who know it and Washington Heights, uh, Manhattan, and now uh, in, um, hail from San Diego. Um, so I began doing um, ethnographic research. Ethnography, if those who don't know, is a branch of anthropology where one um, looks specifically at some aspect of a culture, any culture. It could be about food, it could be about um, sexual habits, uh, pregnancy, um, and, and and let's say, and music. And so uh, I'm a East European uh, Jewish background, you know, Ashkenazic Jew, like 90% uh, of American Jewry. Uh, my grandparents on both sides of my family is coming from Eastern Europe. My mother's side, Lithuania, a small town outside of Kovna, a Kaunas or Kovna as the Jews call it. Um, and my Zeta, actually he was from Germany, so Central Europe. And then on my father's side, uh, Ukraine, a town called um, Dombrovica, and my baba, my mother's side, uh, Stolin, a, a small town in southern Belarus, and, and we're Hasidic. And I mentioned that because, so I grew up with a lot of Hasidic culture. I'm not a Hasid, and I, I, I would never pretend to be, though um, my grandparents and my great-grandparents were Hasidic. But the aspect that stayed with me was the music, if you know, you know, that is what really set Hasidim apart and really why the philosophy grew leaps and bounds in the 18th century to the 19th century is because um, one could connect spiritually to God, uh, he ever, she ever, whoever, you know, your, your God is through music. And, um, and so I play a lot of Nagunim, particularly from that region of Stolen, but others have researched and so forth. So, um, so one of the things I do is music, and that's why I'm playing at the wonderful synagogue in Tustin, California, um, at Congregation B'nai Israel, and we'll be doing a number of tunes. Uh, and you, and uh, Ari mentioned uh, Morocco as an aside. So one of our tunes, I'm looking actually on the playlist, <laughs> so it's not pretend. There, our first tune, what we'll open up that evening will be Ma'at Sur. We all know Ma'at Sur, Yeshua T. We sing it, you sing it last night. You'll sing it tonight. I'm gonna to ask you a question. How many of you sing all the verses though? Besides just the first verse, right? There's many verses. And if you read them in English, quite a, quite a history. Um, we're gonna do a Moroccan version though. We're not gonna do the Ma'at Ma uh, oh God, now I have just the Moroccan. Uh, uh, what's a, oh, you know, I can't, you know what? I don't have the East European version in my head right now that I grew up singing. I have my wife been singing it over and over. I'll get it in a second, but you know what it is. And, but the point of Rock of Ages, we call it in English. Um, this uh, melody is on my recent uh, album called Shimmering Lights. Um, if you're interested in getting it, whatever, you'll see it out there. And it's Hanukkah songs uh, that are sung in Hebrew, Ladino, the language of the Iberian Jews, Yiddish, Central East European language of the Jews. And we even have an English song in there that I wrote, uh, co-wrote with my wife. Um, and why I wanted to do that is to exp explore, because in, in, in America, we often tend to see things through the lens of the Ashkenazim, right? Where we get a little tunnel vision. And, um, and people also at, often ask me, say, yeah, so Jewish music, is it, is it, is, is klezmer music, is it all the same? I said, no, the Iberian Jews of uh, the 12th century, 11th century were not singing what the Jews of the 11th, 12th century were singing in Poland or what the Jews were singing in Morocco or Egypt or even in Dagestan in the Caucasus. And uh, there were, quote, the mountain Jews that lived in the Caucasus. So we all bring, what do we bring to the tables? The, the Jewish musicians and the singers and people who heard melodies were using local indigenous folk music imbued with what? What is the D and A? The root of all Jewish music, it's the 
what we call these scales from the Middle East, most likely from Central Asia, actually starting and then coming to the Middle East. So we know the Middle East, the Levant, we call it. Then Central Asia, the, the Stans, whether it's Kyrgyzstan, Dagestan, uh, Tajikistan, Northern India, these scales. And so the root of Jewish music and the root of the music that I'll be playing uh, for the most part Sunday, the DNA, uh, the, this, root, this music is, the root of the music, I should say, is older than the word Judaism, older than the word Christianity, and older than the word Islam. So it's older than the Abrahamic religions. It's really these old scales. And when I play the violin in a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll um, demonstrate that to you. And so I wanted to make sure when we did this album to be inclusive as much as possible, you know, um, I, you know, there were so many countries I couldn't include. And of course the album would have, the, the label would have never put it out because it would have been like a six hour compendium, you know? So, uh, but we did pretty well. So we're gonna play a tune, like I said, from Morocco um, that usually was just accompanied by percussion. Often the Northern Arabic, there could be a little, there could be some uh, plectrum instrument, but often was just percussion and voice would be the instruments uh, moving the song along. So, you know, I've been uh, researching music. I was, I was saying earlier um, before I talked about Mahatsur is, um, I went to Eastern Europe. So my focus is klezmer music, though I'm interested in Ladino and, and Mizrahi Arabic Jewish music uh, or anything kind of Jewish music. But you know, it's in my, my yichas, my pedigree is Eastern Europe. So I went to Eastern Europe when it was still the East Bloc, um, when not many tourists were going there um, and seeing who would might remember Either they could remember an actual tune or a Yiddish song or a hum a tune, or maybe they were a musician if I lucked out. That was going to be rare. I, I met a few. Um, and um, through my travels, what was interesting to find out as well, as I was meeting Jews. So let me give you a good hard example. So here I am in Eastern Slovakia, if you can picture that in your mind, right? It was Czechoslovakia then, but we have Eastern Slovakia. The capital of Slovakia today is Bratislava. The largest city in the east is what is called Kosice. Um, but the Jews there of a certain age who were born before World War II didn't call it Kosice, they called it Kaschau. It's a Hungarian term. And so that also informs you of what, what Jews call a certain city. So they were Hungarian, you know, they were more Magyar in a way than they were Slovakian Jewish. Um, but why I mentioned this, so I was in this, in the little, Stiebel in the synagogue, and I met the met the uh, bookkeeper Ellie Mermelstein, and we were talking. He says, "Oh, if you want to get some really good older Jewish music from the Carpathian Mountains that perhaps Yale you don't know, or he would say Yitzchak, Yale meant nothing. In fact, during my research these, for these Jews or anybody, they, Yale, what? It's a, a Goisha nomen. It's so it's it's so Gentile. <laughs> but so I said, call me Yitzchak." So he'd say, yes, I could really want to find something, go deeper into the Carpathian Mountains, which then was the Soviet Union. And there I met, who did I meet who played some of the music still, and even some, even remembered some lyrics, not Jews, Roma, Roma, or as we say in Yiddish, the Zigeiner, or known as gypsies, but the, the, the more politically correct term is Roma. And so that's interesting, right? Bringing that to the, because a lot of people say, oh, when you play the violin, you know, the Jewish violin or the gypsy violin, it has that East European, that crying sound. And of course the violin is an instrument that Jews gravitated to in Eastern Europe because it's closest to the voice. The Roma as well, something they can emote on. But it, it was the Roma also who informed me about Jewish music in certain regions, Carpathian mountains, and all the way across Romania to the very north east, a region we call Bessarabia or Moldova and Moldavia, that region, uh, where you might say, well, Yale, did you speak their language? You might even ask, what do they speak? And they, well, their language, their, they don't, their language, it would, uh, besides if it's Romanian, or Ukrainian, or Hungarian, they speak Romani, which is Sanskrit based, but some spoke Yiddish. A, a better Yiddish from I, a better Yiddish from me, from I. Uh, and why? Because they were playing with Jewish musicians in the band. 
And just like Jews who played in Roma bands, Romani bands, they learned to speak Romani, some of them. So there's that give and take, and of course, language. Because what is music? It's a language, right? It's a language. And it connects us all. So um, so I mentioned the Mao at Sur. Uh, we're going to do a tune. You'll recognize. Oh, Hanukkah, Hanukkah, da 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 right? Da 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 da. So that's a classic Yiddish tune. Um, actually, the uh, words were written in the early part of the 20th century. Um, but I'll do a version. I, I we do the we do the classic. But often, what I'd like to add is I add new parts. So the beginning part kind of almost sounds a little of a bluegrass feel. On Shimmering Lights, what I do is I add other genres to the Jewish genre. Some bluegrass, some swing, some blues, some jazz, classical. Uh, there's even some improvisation that has kind of a rock feel. And some of you might say, whoa, but it's not Jewish. Well, <laughs> you know, what is Jewish? The, the, the recording from 1913? A scratchy 1913 record that comes from Odessa. Well, that's certainly, we've captured a moment, but what about that same melody that you're listening to from that 1913-78? What about it in 1813 or 1713? Well, you're saying, yeah, oh, ridiculous. That's ridiculous. There were no recordings then. Of course not. Ah, my point. Meaning the guy who played it in 1713, that cat, did not play it the same way as you're listening to that 1913 recording. So what is more traditional? Who knows, right? The word tradition is always in flux. It moves and culture grows, right? I mean, uh, I would imagine that most Jews or, or those li listening to me, whether Jewish or Gentile, do not believe in evil spirits that uh, enter your body. Um, you know, I'm more of a man of science. Well, that's about the Dibbuk, the Dibukim. Well, 500 years ago, most Jews believed in the Dibukim, the Dibiks, those spirits that came into, generally not the best spirit. So we move forth. So Jewish culture has moved forth. So here we are in the 21st century. So to keep alive and breathing this beautiful tradition, and we love that tradition, how far back you can trace it, but also to make it contemporary and, and, and interesting for the next generation, right? If I'm only playing for the generation that was born in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, what about the generation of my daughter born in, you know, late 1990s and those in the 2000s, right? Because they're going to carry on. And it's, you know, the cycle of life, right? Lador Vador, all right? You know, Findoris Bisdoris from generation to generation. So, so some of the music I play in a more traditional style and some I, I add other aspects to just to broaden it because that's how I feel as an artist. Um, oh, Maybe some of you might know this. There's an old Yiddish tune called Bulbus. It's about potatoes. It's a, a song of poverty. You know, uh, all groups in the world who have gone through poverty, whether it's Jewish or not Jewish, uh, often write songs about being hungry. You know, that is the, you know, if you're hungry, you can't think about anything else, really. It's hard, you know, except keeping warm if you're cold and keeping a roof over your head. But literally, that is it you know, real gnawing hunger, which thank God, you know, I've never felt I've been hungry, but never starving. But why do I mention this song? So do you know the song Bulbus, it's Bulba, the Yiddish word for potatoes, though one can also say Kartoffel. That's the Germanic Yiddish. Bulba is the Belarusian Yiddish. Hebrew, what? Pri Adama, right? Fruit of the earth. Um, so there's a song about eating potatoes on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but then Saturday, Shabbos, can you just eat boiled potatoes? It's Shabbos. How do you celebrate Shabbos? Oh, we have a Shabbos surprise. Uh, what do they say? Oh, we're going to have potato kogel <laughs> or kegel, as I would be saying. My ooze are ease, potato kegel, bulbous kegel, and then Sunday continue with the potato. Anyhow, I took this song, traditional song. If you know of Ruth Rubin, a great collector of Yiddish songs, the 20th century, you might have some records of hers or even the book. She includes it in her uh, anthology. Um, I decided to write a song called Latkes, eating latkes every day. Well, what do we do during Hanukkah, everybody? I mean, if you're Ashkenaz, that is, or anybody, I guess anybody, you know, whether Mizrahi or, or, or uh, Sephardic Jew, 
latkes. We 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 eat things. You know, bumuelis is what. That's uh that's like a Greek Turkish donut, and sufganiyot is another. We we eat things in oil, fried in oil. So I did a song about latkes, and but latkes with um, mushrooms, and or latkes with garlic, and latkes with uh, onions, and latkes with cabbage, latkes with a little drink of mashke whiskey. So much latkes that at the end of the song it says, "Oh, I can't eat any more latkes because my stomach oiskaplast my boya oiskaplast." It's a great Yiddish word. You hear that? Oiskaplast. Oiskaplast means burst. Mein boya. My gut, my stomach, and my stomach is, so please don't worry about latkes. And if you've ever fried latkes in your home, I'm sure your home will smell for the eight days, what? Like latkes, because the aroma <laughs> goes through. So we'll do a kind of a funny song. But one of the key things I like to do with Jewish music is you play the melody, you play the arrangement, but then you improvise. What does that mean? Make it up. At the moment, you're, you know, people say, what is improvisation? You know, I say, you know what it is? You're hearing me think out loud. Now, you're literally, you can't, you're not hearing my mind right now, but you are if you listen to the, the music, whether I'm happy, excited, whatever adjective it, that you create in your mind. So um, I like to add a lot of improvisation and, and it frees it up for the other musicians in the band to express themselves because Jewish music is about expressing yourself. There is the canon, there's the code, you have the black notes, you have the language if it's a song, but then you should be, feel free to take it where you'd like to go. And even in classical music, where we often think that's so exacting, you know, there's things called cadenzas, if you know anything about classical music, Bach wrote cadenzas. Um, but a cadenza means that you can, at the end of the piece, da -da -da, it's not over, and then you go into an improv. And so even in classical music, the composers like Bach and Beethoven and whatever, Brahms, Liszt, uh, Grieg, they understood that in certain pieces allow the soloist, if it's a solo piece, to be able to express themselves because they're gonna have been moved already by what you wrote. So their heart is already open. So uh, that's the beauty of improvisation. Um, let me say one more about another tune and maybe there might be some questions. I'm giving a lot of information. Oh. Here's an instrumental piece. So I know Jordan's heard me play this a, lo uh, a lot. So here's a, one of my favorite pieces because I started slow in a rhythm that often was used to accompany the husin and the kala, the groom and the bride, as we'd say, si der chippe or tsu der chippe to the wedding canopy. So it has a slow cadence, what we call it. Uh, you could call it a three, four, if you know it, or even three, eight, a very slow eighth notes. So eighth notes are the beat. And then it goes, and then it gets into the faster part. So I kind of see it as you're getting up to the chuppah, all the kadushim, all the blessings, break the glass, mazel tov, and then boom, all, all, uh, you know, so loves and seek, let loose, you know, all hell breaks loose and, and it's a faster tune. And this is a tune from the Carpathian Mountains. Um, it's called the Kolom, it's called Kolomeka, probably from the region of Kolomia, which is a fairly large city. Uh, if you're not sure, it's south of, uh, 100 kilometers south of Kiev. Kiev, you've heard of, that's the capital of Ukraine. Um, and again, a Carpathian piece played by Ruthenians. You, you, I, I'm interrupting myself. You might ask, well, why the Carpathians a lot? You, know, you seem to go there a lot. The Carpathians was a unique area where you had many minorities living together. Jews, Roma, Ruthenians, Czechs, Slovaks, Ukrainians, Poles, Romanians, Russians, some Greeks and Armenians. That's, that's 11 I just counted, and I'm probably forgetting a, a few. Uh, and then some of the mountain people, they were called Hutzul or Gurali. Um, little ethnic, they were Slavic people, but ethnic groups too. Anyhow, so you have them all living in a mountainous region, mountains of five to 7,000 feet, lots of pasturing, some farming, but it was mountainous, so more of pasturing, timber, lumber, a lot of Jews, and music. And the best musicians generally, or at least the stereotype was, and they were called for the best gigs. So whether you're a Ruthenian, Orthodox Christian, or a Greek Orthodox Christian, you often wanted the Jews 
and or the Roma to play at your wedding because they were some of the best. And so there was a coming together, a mishmash, a cholent. You know the word cholent? Everybody ever had a Shabbos cholent? Probably no one's probably had cholent in a long time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, a meal that one would make on, you know, set it the low heat on uh, Friday, Arab Shabbos, and let it cook 24 hours. Anyhow, it's a mixture, a big goulash. So it's a, this goulash, this cholent of music, musical genres coming together in this relatively small uh, geographic region. And so it's, it's language, music is language. And so the Jews are hearing this and creating their own take on it. And I love that. And so, and this has a nice kind of feel, kind of a cool, cool beat, cool rhythm. And so it's one of the pieces I will also play and I can demonstrate a little piece of it for you in a second. So I've given you a lot of information. I don't know if people have written anything, have any questions. Freilach music, yes, Rochelle, yeah, it is. It's, you know, they didn't call it klezmer, right? Some of the informants, they said, nah, Yitzhak, merhoba nishkazok klezmer. It's given chasana, simcha music. It's, it's given, it was wedding music, happy music, right, right. Klezmer um, sometimes wasn't the term, exactly. Um, yes, and there's Lindy Kaiser. Yes, tr D Detroit, Flint. Yes, I'm, I still have family in, in those cities. So anyhow, maybe um, we'll let Ari, I'll, I'll let him lead it. If, is there some questions or, or comments? And yeah, well, I'll, I think I think, I think it's I think it's been great to get into your, your brain. That was the whole idea here, to understand a little bit about your background and the music we're gonna hear, or if not in this concert, the other people hosting you, where your music comes from and what you do. So it's great. And we're looking forward to some examples. Before you get there, tell us a few things. Wh why were you named Yale? <laughs> Good question. Uh, well, um, the, the, the family lore is, I probably was gonna have the, uh, um, my Zeta, my father's father's uh, name, his, his name was Isidore, uh, Isidore Yitzchak, Yitzchak being his Jewish name. But, and uh, two brothers, what baby was popping out first? And my uncle's son, Isidore, came out first. So my dad wasn't going to name his son Isidore. Um, and because Yitzchak, uh, because, and they knew they had heard of a Yale. I actually have a, an uncle Yale, but married into the family, and I wasn't named after him. But Yale and Yitzchak all begin with the Yud, if everybody understands it. Yeah. So that was it. And so, but it's kind of cool, right? Because if I call... If Ari, if I call Ari, right, you know, and, and he says, hello, who's this? I say Yale. I don't have to say Yale Goldberg, Yale Smith, Yale Davies. There's probably not too many Yales he knows. <laughs> we actually know another Yale, which is oh, very funny. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, real interesting. Nothing Jewish about Yale. Because uh, people say, oh, is there a Jewish connection? No, Yitzhak is Jewish. What is Yale? It actually means upper fertile moor in Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, tell us a little about your background. So, um, you know, where did you learn all this stuff? How many languages do you speak and how did you get into this particular? How did I get this? Well, I say I'm a product of everything on the left and the right, real quick. So from age zero to 12, elementary years, all elementary school, Detroit, uh, middle school, high school, undergrad, San Diego, graduate school, and many other years, New York City, but now back to New York, uh, back to San Diego. So, um, so I come from, a, you know, you know, American, like others, you know, baseball here, even though it's saying Tigers in sort of Yiddish Hebrew, um, it's still a Tigers fan, uh, like sports. I, I was a cross country track and field in high school and college. Um, but I also was imbued with the, a sense of my heritage. So uh, from the Jewish side of things, um, on my father's side, I was imbued with this Hasidic aspect of the, the stories. And in, uh, you know the midrashim, as well as the nigunim, the nigans, um, and some Yiddish songs as well. Uh, and I grew up in a, in a traditional Jewish home. But at the same time, my father was very much, I can say, a person, and my mother, a, per, a person of the prophets, meaning people that were pushing society to be more progressive in politics. So I'm very proud to say. So I just grew up. I grew up in a home. Everything from the left and the right. So on the right, the Hasidish. Aspect on the right, my father was actually Hashomer Hatzair. He was a member of the Hashomer, which is these socialist Zionists, and actually have family that grew, uh, began, and built a kibbutz in Israel called Ein Dor. If you know it, it's in the 
Emek, uh, not far from Mafula. So I grew up with that interesting being socially aware of my the politics, but also my love of Jewish culture, and um, and that kind of just took me on these interesting paths. Uh, tell us some more about these groups who used to sing in the Carpathians and, and the ones you visited. Um, did you find that they integrated a lot so you'd have Jews and non-Jews playing together, or did they generally play in their own groups but interact and share their music in a different way? Well, well obviously, when I was going, there was very few. There was maybe one or two Jewish musicians, and it was... Yeah, I mean, I mean historically. Like but before, historically, yeah. Um, you had bands that were made up just of Jews and made up of Roma, and even of Gentiles, but then there were some bands, most of them were self-contained, right? The, the same religious group or same ethnic background, but there were uh, Jewish bands that actually employed, had a number of Gentiles and particularly Roman musicians, um, just because and why they were friends, but they were also very good musicians. So there was an interesting uh, mixing there. And that's one of the interesting professions because we often didn't see it in other, you know, it, the Jews lived separately often from the Gentiles, except during market days for lots of reasons, you know, anti-Semitism, rabbis worried about boy meets girl, girl meets boy and marries out of their faith, et cetera, et cetera. But musicians, we like to travel, we like to mix because we're, it's all about the music and musical ideas. So you did, uh, in that region, you, you definitely saw uh, this um, uh, polyglot, this, the, the pollinization of different cultures coming together. I think, I think it's a good time for you to play some stuff, sure, some sure, examples, sure. and then we'll have a few more yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me play that, a little piece of that cola make everybody that I was talking to you about that I really enjoy. I'll start it off that slow, kind of marching to the hippa wedding canopy feel. They break the glass and they go into the upbeat. Prela Julie! Thank <laughs> you. 
Very nice. Very nice. Um, I'll give you a break for one second, then I'm going to ask you to play something more on the Mizrahi or Sephardi so we can compare. Sure. Um, what, um, tell us about musicians. Obviously, you have a group, Hot Pastrami, and you're playing, with the, you're playing with the whole sextet at, on Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Um, Pacific time. But what, what other groups or other contemporary groups do you like, do you recommend that uh, our audience check into uh, that are, are our great contemporary klezmer um, Let's see, great in, in terms of in terms of Jewish music. Yeah. Any kind of Jewish music? Yeah. Uh, wow, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like it's like the what do they say? The sh the children of the shoemakers go barefoot because I I listen to I I tend to listen to so much other things besides just Jewish because I'm always in Jewish. But I will tell you a group that I really uh, they've been around I guess a dozen years, but I really love what they're doing both in terms of the Mizrahi and contemporary, in terms of hip hop, beats, um, uh, what are they, they're uh, Yemen Blues, you know the group Yemen Blues, everybody? Yemen Blues is a great group, uh, just really, and really good singing, just uh, something uh, wonderful there. In terms, of, uh, in terms of a wonderful traditional Yiddish singing, um, a wonderful voice, and of course I would tout my, my own wife, Elizabeth Schwartz, uh, who, Sings with Hapastrami, and those who are interested can find more about her voice of klezmer.com. Just the three words, voice of klezmer. Um, is a wonderful singer out of Israel. Uh, not as well known. She's originally from Bells, from this my shtetl, from the shtetl of Bells in Moldova. Uh, Vera, V-I-R-A, Lozinski, L-O-Z-I-N-S-K-Y. A very deep kind of contralto voice, and just, you know you know, just a, an instrument like none others. In terms of bands, let me see. I, I like this band out of Barcelona. I think they're called the Barcelona Klezmer Band. They do what they call Gypsy or Roma music and Balkan and Jewish. But I like their, I like that they do some improvisation. The, the, the female vocalist is great. So those are three off the top of my head uh, of, of, in terms of, of, of some Jewish stuff. I, I, actually, I'll say one more, very different. Some people might be surprised. But I really like what he's doing, combining contemporary hip hop poetry with his newfound uh, Judaism. And that's the African-American Nisim Black, who now lives in Israel. Uh, I think it's N-I-S-S-I-M, Nisim, you can just find it. And he's doing this hip hop stuff, but, you know, with the words from Torah and Talmud. Um, and I kind of, and I like that. And, uh, um, because, and, and I'm not a, I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of hip-hop uh, only because I some of it gets a little boring to me some of the the beats just over and over is the same but he does something I just love it because he's adding this Jewish content to it and uh and he's a he's an orthodox Jew I don't know if he's Hasidic or not but he's orthodox you know pay us beard I mean the garb so anyway there's four four wonderful artists if you never heard of any of them check them out <laughs> a lot I haven't heard of um uh, Jordan Young said you brought in the Goyim from Germany. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Oh, he likes it. Okay, yeah. And yeah, the, the Goyim, they're a klezmer band. And uh, guess what? They're all Goyim. <laughs> they, that's why they, they're out of Amsterdam, everybody. So you can check them out. Thank you, Jordan. All right. These are, I was thinking of some new ones. Yeah, I mean, there's some bands from, you know, 20, 30 years ago. It's some bands that are not even playing anymore. Um, but, th but those are the ones I'm talking about, uh, some of the contemporary ones that I, uh, I, I really do like. Oh, um, I will say that uh, I will tell you a, a, um, an artist who's a great classical violinist who's doing a lot, all kinds of music, including Jewish. Her name is Rachel Barton, B-A-R-T-O-N, Pine, P-I-N-E. Some of you who just follow classical, she's one of the great virtuo, uh, virtuosic violinists in the world, you know, where she plays and, and the Philharmonic plays behind her. <laughs> you know, she's the soloist. And I actually got to compose a piece for her. She... I composed a three movement piece for solo violin based upon Jewish and Roma and Romanian and Hungarian themes. Uh, and she's played it for the Israeli Philharmonic all over. It's called the Bessarabia Suite. And she actually, she, I was surprised, you know, I'm doing my Facebook and word and popped up Yale. I'm going to play live your piece on my show today. So I quickly, you know, so if you go to Rachel Barton Pine, you, you, you can hear 
the first movement of that piece. And she plays all kinds of Arabic music. I mean, she plays classical, Mozart and Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, but she loves to experiment and push the envelope. So if you're looking for classical music that's also doing some Jewish stuff, Rachel Barton Pine is one. Right. So let me play a little Mizrahi, little, hear this scale. You hear this, listen to this. Those scales everybody so the the scales of jewish music are not the are not the major scale like so we have those minor scales and then if you take the middle eastern scale Of course, rhythm helps you gets into this. So there's different kinds of rhythms that we hear in Mizrahi, so, like this. not even musicians you can hear the difference between some of those scales so that's that's giving you some sense of the dna that middle that middle eastern scale that that roots all all from yemenite to ethiopian to spanish to lithuanian jewish music is there a place in the world you haven't been that you want to go <laughs> where, where, when the COVID, when COVID is is over and you can travel again is there a place you're going for your next research Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to, it's funny, we've been talking, Morocco, I want to go to Morocco. I was just about to go there when I was doing my book on Sephardic Jews, and then the Gulf War started, and the consulate said, uh, we, we don't suggest that you go there right now. <laughs> so I, I was travel. I was in Spain already to, to go across the Straits of Gibraltar. So Morocco is definitely a place I want to go, and I, and, and, um, and I also want to go to Uganda. I've been in touch with those, that, that interesting tribe of Jews there online and and heard some of their music and just you know, just love to hang out and learn from them so there's there's two countries right there can you tell us about kind of the revitalization or what's going on with klezmer music in the states although i hear and i've learned about this in the last i'd say mm -hmm. nine ten months that there's way more going on in canada so i don't know if you could tell us a little about klez canada and there's another kind mm -hmm. of um klezmer festival that happens that most of us here never heard of but we were actually i was trying to get people to go before COVID right. struck and kind of hit hit uh, hit them as well but what's going on in the contemporary world? well the the you know the revival quote so it's 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 so past revival right it's it's it has grandchildren now um began in the mid 70s and really the peak of klezmer in the united states uh it's it, sorry the revival actually began interesting in the united states but then went over to germany I would say 80s up through 2000. 
now there it's still interest but the, but now there's so many bands but now besides klezmer people are interested in in, in middle eastern music mizrahi music um taking contemporary rock or whatever and, and adding with jewish music but there are festivals klez canada for example in um what is that? Is that, uh, I forget, I think it's Montreal or Tr Toronto, one of the, uh, no, I think it's Montreal, Close Canada, because Toronto has Ashkenaz, and um, there is a big festival coming up in New York, actually, called, uh, what's it, New York Yiddish, Yiddish Week, coming up Christmas, right, from Christmas Eve to uh, New Year's Eve. So there are a number of Jewish festivals. Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, now, in the 80s, I could, I knew all the musicians, you know, we could count, I could count on my hands, the Klezmer bands. Now, you know, many of them, of course, are defunct, but, you know, there's so many people playing, whether professionally or, or as amateurs. Um, uh, one of the biggest festivals, of course, this year took its toll on everybody because of the pandemic, was one of the Krakow Jewish Festival. You might've heard of that already, you know, huge, you know, that, that was fun to play on the main stage. I played in front of like 20,000 people, you know, who would think, 20,000 people will be hearing Jewish music, <laughs> but uh, I mean, that's, you know, not rock Jewish music or something, you know, I wasn't one of the Ramones playing, you know, or Bob Dylan, um, but yeah, some of those, uh, there are festivals, people can definitely check that out. I'd like to actually say something, let those people know, since I, I sort of have the mic, that I hope to, you know, 2021, we, we cross our fingers, p -p -p -p, you know, whatever our superstitions are. Um, in October, lead a tour, a Jewish tour in the sense that it's Jewish oriented in terms of the subject matter, though anyone could go on it, by Ayelet. It's, uh, you know, Ayelet leads to A-Y-E-L-E-T dot com, Ayelet. They've been doing it for 40 years, tours all over the world, particularly Israel. But I'll be leading a tour to Romania and Moldova, specifically looking at the Jewish music, meeting some musicians and me playing concerts with locals. So if Yes, you'll hear the history, synagogue, and some of the Holocaust. We don't want to focus only on that. Foods, and, and also the non-Jewish history, but the special aspects. So we'll travel and, and even go end up going to Elie Wiesel's hometown of Siget, uh, where music, um, I met Elie Wiesel personally and sat down with him at a wedding. I was playing at a wedding. I saw him. I went up to him. I had the chutzpah. People say, oh, this musician, what's he doing with Dr. Wiesel? And I, and... I'm playing this song, and I said, Dr. Wiesel, can I bet you a buck? He says, well, I'm not much of a, a better, but I'll bet you a dollar. What is it? I bet you know this tune. He says, okay, I'll bet you. And so I started to play this, and guess what? He started to sing it. Very, that's it. You know, eight little bars. And it's the most famous Hungarian Jewish melody. That, and he was born in the Hungarian part of Romania. So I knew he knew that. So anyhow, I put that out there. Look for it. Because if you if you like some of the stuff I'm telling you now, you'll like it even more when you're there in person to meet some of these people or be in the places where the music is in Romania, Moldova. So. Very cool. Um, is there something else you can play us before we do our final questions? I'll yeah, let people have a chance see. to put their questions into chat. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I'll play the um, I'll play that classic uh, song about potatoes eating and everything. Only it's luck is. Well, I'll just play. I, I won't do the singing. Let 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 my wife do the singing on Sunday. <laughs> Very nice. So uh, last few questions. Uh, sure. Jerry and Marilyn Gross want to know, do you always play the same violin or do you have a collection oh, of violins? I have several. I have seven, <laughs> but I, I haven't been playing them all. I play generally two different violins. This one, this one here 
is my newest one. I got it about two years ago, uh, built just, you know, about 15 years ago. Because some people say, oh, if the violin is not at least 100 years old, it can't be good. No, there are, there are very good luthiers making great violins. This is a copy of an uh, Amati. It's not a real Amati. Uh, the real Amati would be it's something I could not afford because it'd be many millions of dollars. But it has a great sound. Very, and I used it acoustically or just a mic. And then I have another violin that was actually made for me uh, in Poland, uh, in Krakow. And... Uh, and um, and it has a, it's a kind of a, it has a kind of a wide sound. And I use that, I have a pickup in it so I can, you know, uh, go right in and play um, through the amplifier than rather having a, a, a mic. So, and I have others, I have like some folk fiddles. When I travel generally, when I was doing my research in the East Block era, and even still today and so on, I would take my uh, lousiest, <laughs> <laughs> least worth violin because I never knew what was going to happen uh, during the East Block era when the borders were very difficult to cross and you know the guards were suspicious because I had film and tape recorders and you know tape recorder and cameras and whatever and you know and Mar Americans weren't traveling and I was traveling by myself um they would wonder why I had the violin what is this is it yours and da 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 and so um if it so if, if they were going to take it or something or come you know and pound it, it, it was not worth anything. So, but now when I'm on tour, I'm with the band, everything's fine. I take my best violins, so. When you, when you did the Krakow um, Jewish Festival, was it with Hot Pastrami? What was the- what Yeah, yeah. Um, no, actually I was playing, I, uh, Hot Pastrami wasn't, we didn't get there, but I was there, I was working and I, and then I was playing, I played with, I'll tell you, oh, I played with Musikash. That's a great, uh, M-U, is it M-U-S-Z-I? M-U-S-Z, K-A-S. They're still around today. They really hit the scene in the 80s and 90s because they took Hungarian folk music and brought it to people like, whoa, this is an interesting string. But then they did research in Transylvania. These are all non-Jews who learned some old Jewish melodies from some Roma, older guys. And so they had a, so for about five, six years, they were kind of big on the circuit playing this old Transylvanian Jewish music. So I played with them. And, um, but Hoppus Rama, we've played in festivals like Fjert, there's a big Jewish festival there. We've played in Berlin, uh, yeah, just many, played in Copenhagen, played in Stockholm, we've played in Paris festivals, played in Bordeaux, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, and now the, the pinnacle, you're playing in Tustin on Sunday, yeah. <laughs> 6 30 p.m. Pacific time. Well, exactly. <laughs> Tustin, you know, well, listen, my, my cousin put a, you know, uh, introduced me to the rabbi there. She'll be there. So, uh, a shout out to my cousin Roberta and um, you know first of all we're happy to play you know during the artists you know people talk about essential workers and you know all the health care are the most essential in the world and then every you know grocery da, 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 and then it came to our artists well art you're not that essential but you know what people are finding out 10 months later how essential art really is because without art your life is it's just it's humdrum and you know I mean for those who aren't artists and it really gives you that it, you know, it's like, yeah, I can eat food without spice, but why don't I want to put spices in my food? We're the spice of life and that makes everything you do. So now we are essential. So I'm happy to play with my guys. Um, and, you know, hopefully next time I see Ari, you know, uh, when it's live sometime, we've had our vaccine summer fall of 2021. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll play some live, live concerts. Because let me tell you, this is great. I love doing this. And talking wise and everybody high in New York, New Jersey, wherever you are, it's great. I, I wouldn't have thought about this, but when I can see you in the audience, I can see you smile, move, whatever. I can touch you. We can talk. Um, for a musician, I need that tactile. I need that live. It, it, it really helps. Um, I did know. notice that Vivian Cohen was dancing for you. We'll make sure. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, so last few questions. Number sure. one. Yeah. Well, someone asked, uh, how, how young were you when you first picked up the violin? What, what led you to Eight the years old. Mrs. Baker. God, if it wasn't for her, I might not be. I might not be sitting in front of you. Uh, I'd probably be the lawyer. I was about to go to law school and dropped out, so I'd probably be a lawyer. Um, but uh, or Mrs. Baker could have, instead of offering free violin lessons in the Detroit public school system, could have offered me the bassoon, <laughs> so I could play bassoon. 
It'd be a little different. It'd be um, a little different. <laughs> so you, you, you mentioned you were traveling with recording devices. So I assume you recorded video and audio of the different uh, groups you met. What did you do with all that recording? Okay, so in the early, so in the beginning, I was, it was, I just recorded with black and white photography and cassette photography, and then starting in the '90s, so that was a the '90s uh, videotaping some of the material uh, as well as just some tape recording. So that material, so the archives, I have the archives, and one day that archives is gonna, it's a very valuable archives in terms of what it has captured. It, I, many ten, many thousands of uh, negatives. Um, and many hours of people speaking and hours of, of, of seeing people. Some of what have I done with it? Some of it you can go see, folks. I made films. I made a film called The Last Klezmer. If you go to you know yalestrom.com, you'll The Last Klezmer has been shown around the world. I made a film called Carpati, Fifty Miles, Fifty Years, uh, narrated by Leonard Nimoy. It's been seen around the world. I made a film called Lachaim, Comrade Stalin, about that area of the Jewish, first Jewish Republic before the state of Israel called Biro Bajan. Do you know that there was a state before there was a state? It was, it was, it was so far east, it was past Siberia. <laughs> it's closer to Anchorage than it is to Moscow. Um, and so I've made many films. So I've, some of it, I, so my art, I've, my research I've put into my art, if I may say, you know, so we were talking about, for those who have kids, grandkids or just love a good story, Everybody, I wrote a story about a klezmer trombonist. Um, his name is Shloimel Boimel, Shloimel, like Shlo Solomon. Boimel means oil in Yiddish. Shloimel Boimel and his lucky dreidel. Look it up, buy it, support art. And what it is, you can read it from left to right, like we read English, but it's also in Yiddish, from right to left. And that's what's unique. There's, there's a publisher in Sweden that's been publishing new books in Yiddish and you think what for the all the 10 people in the world no no he did Harry Potter the first volume or the first book uh in the spring and it sold out a couple thousand which you know it's not a couple million but who would you know some people might think ah 20 books no he sold over 2,000 like within a month um so look at Shlomo Boimel so what I'm proud of most and then I'll be quiet is that I've taken my research and have put it into art film books theater, drama, and, and uh, photographic exhibitions, and just, and, and then academic, uh, you know, articles, um, so that you can, so that I don't just preserve it in amber, but I extol it and push it forth to the new future, right, because it, who, when, you know, one day when I am six feet, six feet under, social distancing, <laughs> I'll be six feet under, um, my daughter will carry on that tradition, and I hope her children, my grandchildren, you know, it, it's all, right, who knew, did my great, great grandfather think I'd be doing this today? He didn't know me, but I bet he's smiling somewhere and it, that I did it. My last question actually is to turn it. So you talked about the Krakow Jewish Festival. We talked about Klez Canada and Ashkenaz and, and, and actually there's one in Berlin that Julian yeah. and Judelman And there's a big, to. there was a festival for a while. What was it called? Something in Vancouver too. They might've taken a year or two, if I can't remember. Anyways, there's there's so many now. But my understanding is there's one place in the world where you really don't find klezmer or as much klezmer. Where's that? That's Israel. <laughs> is well, that true you know what? and what's it's, going on okay. there? Okay, well, it was sort of, it used to be true. Real quick, the history about that. After World War II, Israel was so Hebrew focused, you know, for them, Yiddish, oh, the language of death, language of concentration camps, they really were, Sadly, they, they, they it almost, they didn't quite, almost outlawed Yiddish. They weren't going to allow classes in this. You know, the Yiddish radio had some newspaper, but they really were negative, negative, the establishment. So it was Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew. Then starting now in the 80s and 90s with the Klezmer revival and other countries, the Jews in Israel looked kind of stupid, like, wait a minute, every other country, the Goyim are reviving Yiddish and what we got it. So now there is a, a, a good, there's, uh, there are, there's some really fine, um, uh klezmer uh, ensembles in um in israel there's a there's a, a, a yiddish club called young yiddish young yiddish in in tel aviv uh, uh there's some magazines and poetry so it's it's not frowned upon as much as it used to be it's, it's, oh it's my bobas and zetas forget about it you know but now um, but but really, you know what the, the hit music of today? I was just talking with Israeli. You know what the hit music today is Mizrahi music. It's the it's the Middle Eastern music, and I understand why. Because for me, when I hear the Middle Eastern scales, that gets me going. 
and you put a nice little drum to it, you know, a little doom back. But yeah, but Israel, Israel has um, come forth. So since it's uh, so no longer that it looked down on Yiddish, but now it's something also, well, uh, people are expressing themselves in a positive way. And not just among Orthodox, so that's fine. Datim and Hasidim, but secular Jews uh, or non-Orthodox Jews in Israel are also in, uh, are, are doing things in Yiddish culture. Uh, the, the University of Bar Ilan, by the way, is probably one of the centers there. It's t- it has a good Yiddish department in Bar Ilan. Great. Well, it's 1.30 on the dot, so I wanted to thank you. I know people have to get go light their candles on the East right. Coast. We have Canadians on board here. Um, they've got to take care of stuff in Canada. Oh, you know, Bear they Bouchon's like- going. Civil, yeah. yes. Yeah, they're like- oh, looking for my movie. I was there in Bear Bouchon. L'chaim, comrade Stalin. <laughs> Um, so I just want to thank you for being with us. I look forward to hearing your music now that I've got into that, the brain a little bit there. Um, nice. So on Sunday, I will at least, uh, you know, oh, do you have the, do you want to share the playlist? Is that, is that legal? Can you share the playlist so people can like follow along on Sunday? Oh you yeah. You mean to put it right, just type it in right now? Sure. No, no, you no, email it to me and I'll email it to oh. everybody. So they'll, they'll oh, have yeah, the, I'll yeah, email yeah, it to sure. Beth Elster and she can share it, but people can have the playlist and they'll like, oh, this is what's coming up. It's so cool. Um, oh yeah. No, thank you. I'll do it right now. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll get the playlist. We, oh, good. Sloma put up, oh, oh you did, Ari. Thank you, Sloma. I, I mean, I don't even, you know, I don't even pay attention to this, I, the Zoom chat. So it's nice to see, <laughs> is Six Feet Under a Movie on Netflix? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> That's a good one. It is, actually. It's a great series. Uh, but oh, it is, actually. It has nothing right, to do with is. you. It's a very, very good series. Like, probably one of the best I've ever seen. But, uh, but I wanted to thank you. I want to wish you happy Hanukkah. Ari, uh, yes. Thank you for this happy opportunity. Hanukkah. Afrei lechen Hanukkah Sameach to every the 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 Svet Nacht do you say in Yiddish the set the the second night and I look forward to to doing more stuff with you Ari I really appreciate the forum um, and you got a great you got it and what I love is you got such a great audience you know I have to say I see people even with the Zoom I feel connected you know sometimes you have an audience that's a little bit more stayed and quiet but i see this is a very energetic audience yeah well well vivian cohen has has earned herself a front row ticket to your next <laughs> live concert here in orange county so we'll put her up there anybody else who likes to dance we'll put you next to vivian with that everybody i just wanted to wish you all a yes. good shabbos yeah good shabbos and stay healthy everybody right. please stay healthy and uh we'll see you on sunday twice yes. maybe okay yeah everybody. why not i'm there look me up at <laughs> yale strom bye-bye Zygazan. thank you jordan bye, ida bye. cliff all bye, you Anna. wonderful people bye bye Bye, wendy bye, and bye. the grosses and lindy yes and I rita see ingrid yeah. wow New there are a lot of people out there today good job there were? i know go go I cook. hey guys you have uh oh it's running out of time to cook some latkes yeah good right. all right guys i'll sign up i'm gonna send this to you right now bye yeah. everybody bye. look me up good night bye.